yes. So now we'll transition to the next part of the program. Uh, we are uh, moving into the Queen Mary Global Policy Institute next UK policy roundtable, which will go further into uh, details uh, over the future of the EU-UK security relationship, precisely with the title uh, Re-establishing Trust, which was one of the key themes that was highlighted uh, uh, by the uh, British ambassador uh, and by uh, Mrs. Uh, Sylvie Berman. Um, I will moderate uh, this roundtable um, and again, I would like to uh, to ask the audience who is following to not to hesitate to type in uh, their comments or questions ahead. We have uh, several uh, speakers today. Uh, they will uh, come in a minute on the screen. Um, and uh, our our uh, I will introduce um, them. Um, and yes, we see everyone. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. And, and I'm sure that some of you uh, possibly will have also some reaction to what has been uh, said also uh, in the uh, opening uh, speeches. And I would like, uh, first of all, uh, so I will introduce you one by one because we have so many speakers that the audience uh, can follow. Our first speaker is uh, Jean uh, Gener General Jean-Marc uh, Vigilant. Good afternoon. Uh, you are director of the French War School, uh, which I think trains the generals of uh, tomorrow. Uh, you have uh, a very impressive career uh, as uh, in, in the military, and you you're initially uh, also you have graduated from the Ecole de l'Air de Salon de Provence, uh, and you have done I think quite a number of. Uh, missions um, and uh, uh, war missions. I've counted 90 missions. Uh, so you have an extensive uh, experience. And maybe just to mention that before um, being appointed as a director at the war school, uh, you were also returning from the Levant, where you represented France in the combined command of Operation Inherent Resolve, which um, was the anti Daesh coalition. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, you have about 10 minutes uh, and I will introduce our other speakers later on, but they will all touch on different aspects of uh, security after you talk. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for giving me the opportunity to share my views on the subject and good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, before taking a forward looking approach to the future of UK EU relations, I think it is important to take a quick look at recent history to explain one of the reasons for the UK CSDP position. Although France and the United Kingdom were founding members of NATO in 1949, their differences on security and defense issues in Europe originated in the Suez crisis in 1956. In the context of the Cold War, in reaction to Nasser's nationalization of the Suez Canal, France and UK launched a military operation to regain control of the canal. However, despite their military success, both allies came under such strong diplomatic pressure from the two leading nuclear powers, USA and USSR, to withdraw their forces. This was a clear victory for Nasser and a humiliation for the two former empires. They drew radically different conclusions. De Gaulle's France then decided to restore its strategic autonomy by leaving the NATO command structure in order to develop its nuclear deterrence, the force de frappe. The objective was to guarantee its independence while remaining within the Atlantic Alliance. Conversely, the United Kingdom, which was already a nuclear power but dependent on American support, decided to draw closer to the United States within the framework of the special relationship in the hope of avoiding any new strategic surprises and discreetly influencing the decisions of its major American partner in order to preserve its interests. After the end of the Cold War in the 90s, during numerous external crisis management operations, France and UK rediscovered the proximity of their doctrines of force employment. 
Despite their willingness to work together, the two countries remain opposed on the need to develop a real policy of cooperation in security and defense within the EU. The French want it to be autonomous, and the British want to ensure NATO's preeminence in European defense. In the 2000s, the acceptance of CSDP progress by the US and UK is subject to three conditions known as the three Ds. No duplication of NATO assets, no discrimination against non-EU allies, and no decoupling between EU and NATO. The full reintegration of France into the NCS, the NATO Common Structure, in 2009 marks a definite shift in NATO's perception of France's willingness to strengthen the European military capabilities. What is the current situation now? As stated in the French 2021 strategic update, the new global strategic environment is today characterized by its complexity, rapid change and unpredictability. In addition to the hybrid security challenges, mixing state and non-state actors and blurring the line between war and peace, there is now the uncompromising return of the great power competition in international relations, even on the very periphery of Europe. In the strategic vision of our Chief of Defense Staff, General Burkhard, the peace crisis war continuum has given way to the triptych competition, contestation, confrontation. Permanent competition in the new domains of warfare, space, cyber, information, etc. Contestation of global commons and international norms, which can lead to a confrontation, including a high intensity conflict. Although for 21 of the 27 EU member states, including France, NATO remains the cornerstone of the collective defense of the Euro-Atlantic area, especially in a high intensity scenario, Europeans must be prepared to face security challenges on their own, which will not necessarily overlap with the interests of our American allies. I would say that NATO's first added value is to facilitate US and Canada intervention on the European continent. However, if they make another choice because they have other priorities at that time, notably in Asia, the Europeans, including UK, will have to take their own responsibilities. Therefore, in the field of security and defense, two visions clash in Europe. On the one hand, for UK and some of the most Atlanticist European allies, any strengthening of the EU is seen as a risk of weakening the US commitment to the protection of the European continent. On the other hand, for France and other European allies, beyond an economic project, Europe must acquire a political dimension in order to be an actual strategic partner to, of the United States with an autonomous capacity for assessment and action in its neighborhood, which will also reinforce NATO. However, a political dimension and strategic autonomy do not mean a European army, a simplistic and unrealistic concept for a Europe that results from the voluntary association of sovereign countries. Indeed, each member state has a single set of forces that it can decide to use in different frameworks national, NATO, EU, coalition, etc. They are the same equipment and soldiers on whom uniform badges are changed. For the EU to become a true global power and develop its strategic autonomy, the prerequisite is to develop a European strategic culture. The deployment of military capabilities is not only about acquiring new equipment, it also involves the training of personnel, in particular the senior military leadership, who will develop new strategies, imagine new organizations, design and implement new weapons and command systems, and plan and command EU military operations. Each member state is responsible for the training of its officers, who may be called upon to serve in any international organization. After their initial training in their home service, the training path for European officers continues through a higher military education 
consisting of several levels or stages, acquisition of a high level of, of technical or tactical expertise, staff officer training and development of joint skills, and more in-depth knowledge in the political, military, and strategic fields. However, in order to face future challenges and to go further in the construction of European defense, it seems essential to develop a European strategic culture through the convergence of professional military education for officers from the different member states who will become the future European military leaders. This is why in the framework of the French presidency of the European Union Council, the Ecole de Guerre will organize a symposium on European higher military education. The objective will be to reflect on a common need and to establish a roadmap to define the modalities to strengthen the current system of European higher military education for young senior officers. In addition to the curricula for colonel level officers and civil servants of the European Security and Defense College and the NATO Defense College, the aim will be to create conditions of shared space and time for European officers at major level to learn together, but more importantly, to learn from each other. To conclude, a few words about the future of UK-EU defence cooperation after Brexit. In terms of UK-EU relationship, geography matters. UK shares with EU countries the same strategic environment, a common history and culture, and therefore common interests, more so than with the US. This is why, even if because of Brexit, UK no longer has the capacity to contribute to the design of CSDP tools, UK remains a major player in defense and security in Europe. UK has increased its defense budget considerably by 16.5 billion pounds over four years while reorienting uh, its priorities. The integrated review presented uh, by Ambassador uh, Rowling published in 2021 reaffirms UK's interest, UK's interest in securing continental Europe and the will to make UK a scientific and technological superpower with massive investment in space, cyber, AI, nuclear, etc. However, beyond NATO, UK remains in bilateral and multilateral alliances with several EU member states, such as the Joint Expeditionary Force with Denmark, Finland and the Baltic States, the Lancaster House Treaties with, with France and the Combined Joint Expeditionary Force, the European Intervention Initiative launched by France in 2017 and today consisting of 13 able and willing European countries. Since the Brexit vote, the EU has put in place numerous defense projects and programs, such as the Permanent Structured Cooperation, the European Defense Fund, the Strategic Compass to be delivered during the French Presidency of the EU, the EU's new multi-annual budget, which is the first to include a section on defense. It is now up to the to, to UK to decide how it wants to be involved in the, in the EU's defense efforts. Indeed, with its multi-dimensional competencies in relation to different power factors, diplomatic, informational, military, economic, the EU and NATO, which is a purely military alliance, complement each other in meeting the challenges of hybrid scenarios in an increasingly complex world. When it is ready, UK will be able to join all the European initiatives it wishes, probably as a third country, within the framework of flexible structures to be defined in agreement with the EU member states. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, General. Um, and I think it's quite a, a clear overview of, of the areas of uh, cooperation and I'm really glad that you started with this uh, historical reference uh, as well. Thank you so much and I'm now, uh, so again for the audience I know it's going to be a bit long but please keep your questions uh, and don't hesitate to type them 
in uh, the chat. Uh, I will, uh, of course, make sure that we are on time and we have time for a QA. and I'm very glad now to move on uh, to Alice Panier. Welcome. You are the head of the Geopolitics of Technology program at the IFRI, Institut Francais des Relations Internationales. Uh, and I think one of your recent publications was on computing uh, power and the role of quant quantum uh, computing um, in, in the military field, especially in Europe, but you also specialized in transatlantic relations. Uh, and I've noted that uh, you have a book with Mike Gill, Queen's University Press from 2020, um, entitled Rivals in Arms, the Rise of UK France Defense Relations in the 21st Century. The floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I hope you can all Uh, hear me correctly. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces among the um, the other uh, panelists. Looking forward to uh, to hearing everyone. Uh, indeed, as you, the the bio introduction that you just made suggests, uh, have a sort of double uh, hat. Uh, one that uh, used to look very much into France-UK uh, bilateral relations as well as the more traditional part of uh, defense and security and foreign policy and one that is now looking at the more emerging uh, technological aspects and that's uh, actually on the latter that I want to uh, to focus a little bit as part of the, uh, the 10 minutes that I, that I have ahead of me. Um, So the goal is to look, you know, what's what's next and how to rebuild uh, trust and cooperation between the uh, the UK and the EU and the, the UK's EU uh, partners, so that it's the member states uh, in the years to, to come. And I think uh, for a start that we need really to um, to look at um, the opportunities that uh, the British um, government, uh, the current government, but more generally the British uh, political elites give us. Uh, or give you know the policymakers uh, in terms of um, room for maneuver, and with this I have in mind the fact that uh, Boris Johnson, well, first decided to remove uh, defense and foreign policy from the negotiations uh, of the Brexit agreement, as was mentioned by the the ambassador earlier, uh, but also generally speaking that uh, in um, in the British uh, political tradition. Uh, treaties um, are not the favorite way of making uh, of, of uh, working with with partners, and I think um, one way Boris Johnson put it was to um, he didn't want to negotiate any arrangement in which I quote the UK uh, does not have control of its own laws and political life, and then he went on to say I quote the UK is not a European European power by treaty or by law, but by irrevocable facts of history and geography and language and culture and instinct and sentiment. So we can make whatever we want of that statement, but basically what 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 comes out of it is that the UK would go for something loose uh, from a commitment standpoint, um, but strong from a Uh, from a political um, angle. So that means also in practical terms that uh, maybe uh, institutional agreement is not what we should be aiming for. And I'm, I'm thinking here about uh, the CSDP, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, that the, the EU proposal to the UK when it comes to CSDP uh, partnership was very uh, administrative. It was, it was a legal uh, agreement, so to speak an administrative one um, with a lot of conditions that, you know, would not necessarily match what Boris Johnson had in mind in the way he phrased it. Um, we can debate whether that's that's legitimate, obviously, but I think there was a mismatch between the British language and the EU um, offer. What I do think, though, is that we see the UK will uh, consent to written institutional arrangements when they appear necessary to the UK's own um, domestic uh, uh, security and interests, for example, internal security and police cooperation issues, including um, things like the passenger name record or um, data um, DNA databases that are necessary for police investigations or um, participation in EU programs such as uh, research funds For example, the UK sees an interest in those specific agreements and so will agree consent to, 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 to sign them with the EU. So I think from that dual basis that we have when we think about the future, 
in the context of the changing global order and the current threats that the UK and the EU are facing, we need to think about new ways to make cooperation work uh, in, in security uh, between the UK and the EU. So that means looking beyond the CSDP. Basically, the CSDP only deals with certain aspects of foreign and defense policy, such as uh, peacekeeping operations. And the UK uh, has always done far more in operational terms with NATO or coalitions, whether with the US or with France or with Five Eyes, than it has within the, the CSDP, even if it has indeed uh, supported its initial launch and participated in some and even commended certain operations. But the, the truth is that today the CSDP is not necessarily the most relevant policy vehicle for addressing today's key strategic challenges that face both uh, London and the European Union. For example, if we think uh, countering malign foreign influence that is done now increasingly through investment screening for um, you know foreign countries that try to take over uh, European uh, companies for malign um, reasons, in the in the EU, the uh, the actor that does the investment screening uh, that um, over uh, that oversees this inv this investment screening even though it's implemented by member states that's the dg trade it's not the csdp if we think more generally what will be critical for uh the two entities the uk and the eu will be that they have policy coordination and good convergence on a number of key policy issues and i'm going to list some just for for example i've just mentioned international trade uh as relates to investment matters. Then obviously we have everything that relates to data policy, privacy, big platform regulation, when we know indeed hybrid conflict has been mentioned, uh, and when we know how big of an issue disinformation is, when we know as well the the um, the pernicious effects that that um, that the unregulated power of, uh, of big tech companies can have, um, especially when they come from uh, non-democratic um, countries. Uh, the two will have to, to coordinate and converge on AI ethics, especially if we think about the military domain, you know, what to do with the uh, uh, future um, auto autonomous or semi-autonomous lethal, lethal systems, for example. If we think also even from an international security angle, space security or how to respond to cyber attacks and what doctrine to, to, to develop in those areas. These are key areas where, where the, the EU and the UK will have to converge. And so in my view, something that uh, would make more sense uh, for, for dealing with all those threats, so to speak, is a vehicle for discussion and coordination and not so much uh, a UK direct involvement in EU policies, because at this point, at least, it's too difficult for the UK to, to consent to that. And so something more similar, more akin to the TTC, which is happening at the transatlantic level between the US and the EU, that is to say, a forum for, for convergence. Obviously, the EU is a much more it's much bigger entity th than the than the UK is if we if we consider the size of the of the economic market. But you see the idea you see, uh, have in mind something that is more akin to coordination than than integration. Finally, I think what's interesting is that the UK on all the the on many of the aspects that I've mentioned uh, just before is seeking to position itself halfway between the US and the EU because indeed. The UK has to continue cooperating and trading and, and, and exchanging information, what have you, and data with the US and the EU, considering the, the size of both uh, partners for, for the UK. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's when, when the UK, no, sorry, when the EU and the US diverge on all of those issues, the UK is potentially in a position to find, to strike the, a nice balance that, uh, that can... Um, can not necessarily give it leverage, but that can open opportunities for finding compromise also among other actors, including uh, the US and, and the EU. If we think the initial position of the UK on Huawei was, a was an interesting compromise uh, and on data policy, we'll see what, what comes out of the current uh, UK work on that. But uh, the UK seems to be trying to uh, also bridge US uh, and European approaches to that. Finally, I just want to say one quick word that is slightly unrelated, but on the on the trust issue, I think indeed a problem that uh, it was mentioned a little bit earlier, but I think one of the problems that um, especially France and the UK have, but also the, the EU more generally, is that even though you may have trust among uh, civil servants and um, representatives of the state, diplomats, etc., 
the public language and the public discourse uh, is much different and uh, there is uh, a huge opportunity for um, pedagogy and uh, outreach, I guess, from, from uh, both sides of the, of the channel. Uh, especially towards the younger generation, because if we think that uh, you know neighbors are here to stay, so they will, uh, it's it's it cannot be a lost energy if any effort is made in that direction. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, and, and thank you for highlighting as well that the EU is only one format through which uh, cooperation can happen. And I think in the conference, we will also discuss formats such as the E3 or like the Normandy contact group, I think, which are very much relevant. And, and thank you again for highlighting the need for uh, pedagogy and, and changing public discourse. Um, uh, I think this is quite central uh, to uh, the relationship as well. I will now turn to my uh, dear colleague, Violeta moreno Lax. You are full professor of law at Queen Mary University. Uh, you're founder of the Immigration Law Program, director of the Center for the Study of Borders, Migration and Law, visiting at the College of Europe, also legal advisor at the Global Legal Action Network. And I've noted that you founded also the Sahob Met, the Search and Rescue Observatory for the Mediterranean. And you have contributed to many uh, studies as well for EU institutions. One of the latest, I think, was on um, rescue at sea in the Mediterranean, I think, uh, from a human rights perspective. The floor is yours, and I think uh, migration was also highlighted uh, by the British ambassador. So I'm sure you have a reaction on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for having me here today. I, I do have a PowerPoint. I don't know if we can share it. Let's see if uh, the technical uh, part can, can help to share. And just in the meantime, I will also indicate to the audience again, do not hesitate to type in your comments um, and uh, to ask your questions. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of this session. Hi, right. it's me, technical support. Violetta, I haven't, there's a problem receiving your presentation, unfortunately. We're just going to upload it, but if you, I'm going to try and get Agat to uh, uh, upload it for you. It's, for some reason, it's not coming uh, okay. through to uh, me. I, I, so. I'm trying myself, Gary. I'm okay. trying. Okay, um, sorry about this, says, everyone. It says processing. Um, yeah. It's just that, obviously, it's, it's easier for me to speak to the slides rather than there it is. Here, here it is, right? Okay, perfect. So, um, to have control over them, can you see the slides and can you see me? Uh, there we go. Okay, I, I can see both the slides and and the gallery of speakers. So I hope that that's um, what you what everyone is seeing um, as I speak. So, yes. um, coming to to so the future of the relationship between the EU and the United Kingdom on migration. Rather than trust, um, I think this relationship is still being mediated by the slogan that sort of dominated the Brexit campaign and, and, and life thereafter, which is taking back control. And so what I wanted to do in the brief time available is to look at how this relationship has um, been articulated pre-Brexit and after Brexit, um, taking stock of the experience um, of these past two years. And so um, at the beginning, and I, and I hope that this serves as, um, as, a, as a background, right, to, to be able to evaluate the evolution so far and what can be, because, I mean, that's going to allow us to evaluate what the um, future relationship could look like um, as we come to that point. So before Brexit... The UK was already in a very special situation when compared to other member states as a member of, um, of the European Union. It wasn't a member of Schengen, so the Schengen Agreement, the Schengen area, and that meant that it preserved its sovereignty over intra-EU border crossings, right? So regardless of whom would have been um, crossing its borders, the United Kingdom was tracing those borders as if they were external borders, right? Regardless of whether the, those were um, borders with Ireland or with France, right? So because of it not being a, a member of Schengen, it could preserve its sovereignty in that regard intact. It also had a dedicated opt-out 
from everything to do with migration, external borders and asylum policy. And this dedicated opt out took the form of a protocol attached to the Treaty of Amsterdam that was then also renewed and attached to the Treaty of Lisbon. And so this allowed the UK to pick and choose the measures that it would want to implement because it was convenient politically or legally to its own interests. And this allowed it actually to, to cherry pick the, the, the measures and the areas in which it would want to cooperate more deeply with its EU uh, partners. And so it became only a party to select it um, legislation and policy initiatives that were adopted thereafter. And so, for example, it decided to become a party to the qualification directive determining who is and who isn't a refugee or a beneficiary of subsidiary protection under EU law. But it became a party only to the 2004 version of that directive, right? It didn't um, opt in the, the renewed version of this directive, which is of 2011. It also selected to be a member of certain measures regarding visa policy, but not others. And the most important instrument, I think, for current purposes today, um, looking at the controversies flagging the cooperation and the relationship between the two sides, is the Dublin regime, the Dublin regulation, allowing for um, the transfers of asylum seekers whose asylum application it is determined under the regulation constitute the responsibility of a specific member state. And so this regulation is the one that allowed the UK to return um, refugees and asylum seekers who were not their responsibility according to the criteria in that regulation back to France, right? Um, this all allowed the country to preserve its sovereignty intact as long, uh, I mean, so far as migration, external borders and asylum policy is concerned. It was free to decide on the admission of third country nationals subject only to its international law obligations, independent of any EU law obligations stemming from its membership into the European Union. So after Brexit, what has happened um, paradoxically is a loss of control. Rather than gaining additional control, the, Euro the, the, the UK had all the control that it possibly could have as a member of the European Union, only limited by its international obligations, the free, uh, freely contracted international obligations that the UK over the years decided to enter into, including, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights and other human rights treaties that are of relevance to the articulation of migration policy, asylum policy and border controls, but independently from any limitations imposed by its membership um, of the European Union. And what has happened is that as a non-member of the European Union, it no longer participates in key policy initiatives, including EU readmission agreements, the Dublin regime and EU databases. I know that Balsamis is going to be speaking about this in more depth, so I'm only going to touch upon very briefly on this last point. In terms of EU readmission agreements, the loss of membership means that the, the, the UK can no longer rely on the agreements that the European Union as a whole has concluded with other countries around the world. There are more than 20 of such agreements that allows all member states to make use of them to return uh, irregular migrants back to their countries of provenance. This can be a country of origin, but it can also be a country of transit. By no longer being a member of the European Union, the UK can no longer rely on these readmission agreements and thereby has less possibilities to return irregular migrants back to the country of provenance. The UK, in the two years after um, Brexit, has only managed to conclude one such um, readmission agreement with Albania, and it is negotiating another one with Pakistan. As we speak, I think um, it's still being negotiated. Um, if not, it might have already been concluded, but um, in, in, in the last couple of, uh, of weeks. Um, but if you compare them, so we have on the one hand 20 EU readmission agreements, on the other two potentially um, concluded readmission agreements 
um, between the UK and a third country. In terms of the Dublin regulation, not being any more an EU member state, the UK has lost its ability to return asylum seekers back to France, France, which is considered a safer country by the UK. The cost that has been estimated by the Home Office in terms of lost opportunities to return asylum seekers back to France and having to assume reception um, of these persons and the examination of their asylum applications has been reckoned to reach 1 billion euros, right? We didn't see this um, number on the back of a bus during the, the Brexit um, campaign, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's quite a substantial figure that, that one should take into consideration in this regard. In terms of EU databases, there are several, and Balsam is going to speak about this in more detail, but there is one that allows for the correct application of the Dublin regulation and the Dublin system as a whole, which is called Eurodac, that stores the biometric data of asylum seekers, refugees, and other categories of irregular migrants. And this is what allows the identification of people and to attach them to a specific country for responsibility allocation purposes, non-access to this uh, information leads to less capacity to return people back to the countries of transit or um, origin and it also diminishes the ability of the country concerned the uk in this case to counter associated security threats not that i would spouse the view that um, asylum seekers should be considered or framed as a security threat these are a protected category of people under international law with rights and there are human rights and refugee law obligations up to them stemming not only from eu law but particularly from international um, treaties to which the uh, uk remains a party so those obligations remain in place whether or not um, membership of dublin and the related databases could possibly be maintained which is not the case as we speak one big consequence of um, abandoning the European Union has been the redefinition, the need to redefine the external borders of the United Kingdom. And there are three problem areas that I think we need to touch upon. Um, one is Northern Ireland, the other is Gibraltar, and the other one is Calais. In Northern Ireland, we know of the protocol that um, was agreed in, 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 in several iterations. The final, the one that was concluded, by um, Mr. Frost on behalf of the Johnson government leaves Northern Ireland inside the EU common market. This was agreed to avoid a land border within Ireland between the northern part of, of, of uh, Ireland belonging to the UK and the Republic. This requires that custom controls are performed somewhere else, in this case, the Irish Sea. This having therefore a significant impact within the UK. There is a an internal border that turns into an external border for practical purposes, um, dividing two different parts of the United Kingdom as a result of this protocol. There are um, discussions of which we are all aware to see how the frictions that have emerged can be um, tamed, reduced, but for the time being, the, 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 the wording of the protocol remains the same and, and, and the issues have not yet been fully addressed. In terms of Gibraltar, um, the ROC has, is in a precarious situation. You will remember that the population of Gibraltar, like happened in, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, voted overwhelmingly um, in favour of staying and remaining in the European Union. This was unheeded. Um, Spain, in response, has um, responded in, in, in a rather undiplomatic way, one would say, pushing for um, a cost of rain formula of the rock as an inter 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 intermediary phase towards regaining full sovereignty over the world tar. At least this was the position pre-pandemic. We will see what happens after the pandemic um, is overcome. But Gibraltar is not in, in, in an easy situation. Um, it was assimilated for practical purposes to um, the Schengen area before Brexit, but this can no longer be the case. So we'll see what happens as the pandemic um, wanes away and the effects uh, settle. We'll see what the reaction is going to be on the Spanish side of things. But obviously, 
this is going to have repercussions in the manner in which border controls are um, operated between the two countries, and that can lead to further friction in terms of um, migration um, and, and, and citizenship um, issues and sovereign issues generally. Coming to Calais and the channel crossings, um, we need to remember that um, according to a number of treaties, the Treaty of Canterbury in 86, under the Mitterrand, um, Thatcher um, governments came into force that was complemented by the Sangat Protocol and then by Le Touquet Treaty, perfectioning um, a mechanism of juxtaposed controls, permitting the two countries, the UK and France, to orchestrate extraterritorial border controls in um, their respective territories on behalf of their own governments to cater for their migration and security interests. Um, this continues to be the case that formally these treaties have not been denounced, but they have become less effective. There is less of an appetite, particularly on the French side, and um, particularly because of the pandemic, for these controls to be performed in an effective manner. And we have seen a rise um, of side effects as a result of this uh, tension. One such side effect have been um, the chaos surrounding the channel crossings, the drownings that we have witnessed over the latest um, year. In July 2021, there was an attempt to stamp um, this, this situation to tackle the and address the, the, the flows across the channel with a UK-French joint statement that led to an agreement to enhance controls on both sides of the channel, with the UK paying 63 million euros to France um, in return for enhanced patrolling. There was also an offer to exercise drone patrols to enter into joint missions, um, and um, that wasn't accepted by the French. This was renewed after the drowning of 27 people in November 2021, leading to um, standoff that you might all be aware, uh, after which in December, the EU disinvited the UK to a dedicated summit that would have looked into this to find a concerted solution. Um, the European Union also turned down um, its offer, as it, it was hinted at, to open negotiations for a readmission deal. There were several grounds adduced in, 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 I mean, to betray this uh, position, not least on sovereignty grounds and um, human rights concerns that the, the UK policy was giving rise to. Coming to my conclusions and the three options that I see for the future um, possibilities of cooperation between the EU and the UK, we have three. One that I think we can discard from the beginning, which is to see the UK becoming a member of the Schengen Cooperation. Why this is not likely? Because it would imply accepting freedom of movement, which was one of the key reasons to reject continued membership of the European Union, and it would require accepting the jurisdiction of the Luxembourg Court. We could see a bespoke agreement taking form to allow the UK to access some vital measures something in the shape of the Dublin uh, arrangements or of a more partial nature that doesn't entail acceptance of freedom of movement. Nonetheless, I see a difficulty here, which is the rejection, the continued rejection on the side of the UK of the jurisdiction of the Luxembourg Court. This would not be acceptable on the European Union side. What would be the most likely situation, I think, that there is an ad hoc solution, like the one that we saw in July to 2021, to deal with the um, channel crossings. Mm, there is no possibility under EU law for mini Dublin deals to be concluded, but there might be a possibility for bilateral readmission agreements to be um, to be to be concluded between the UK and France, for example. But the most likely, I think, in the short term, would be to see the UK deploying unilateral action in the form of the Nationality and Borders Bill and the measures that have been um, contained in the bill that are currently under discussion and that have been critiqued by a number of different observers, including the UN. One thing that needs to be clear, however, is that human rights obligations stemming from international law continue to apply, as does the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, that doesn't have anything to do with membership or not of the European Union. And this needs to be quite clear on the UK side and on the EU side whenever 
an attempt to conclude a bespoke agreement is made. With this, I finish. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Violeta, and um, I think you've given a very precise overview of the situation of uh, losing as well on the side of migration cooperation uh, for the UK. I'm now very happy to pass on the floor to uh, Paul Taylor. Um, you're at present, uh, so you're a journalist, writer, uh, broadcaster on European affairs, uh, but you, you're uh, having this column, uh, Europe at Large, I think for Politico at present, you're a senior fellow of Friends of Europe, uh, which is a think tank, but you have had uh, quite a, a, a long career as a correspondent and editor for Reuters um, in the past, specializing in European politics, economics, defense and diplomacy, and also the Middle East, and in that um, function of European Affairs Editor, uh, you've been uh, based in uh, Paris, Berlin, and Jerusalem, and I've read also NATO correspondent, but also Bonn, Iran, Egypt, and Kuwait. So the floor is used because I think you will give us a different perspective, maybe more journalistic as well, on the situation and the EU-UK relationship. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, you know, the, the custom is to thank the uh, organizers for inviting you to contribute on a, a timely and important topic. Um, and this is certainly an important topic for sure. Um, whether it's timely, I, I wonder a bit. It's never too soon to start imagining uh, what a better future might look like. But where the EU-UK security and defense relationship is concerned, we may be in for a long wait. Um, when the UK left the EU, and I was just thinking about um, what Ambassador Rawlings said when she quoted Saint-Exupéry, uh, it seems to me sometimes that the, the UK and the EU at the moment are, are, are two friends not looking at each other, not uh, standing side by side and looking outward, but at the moment standing side by side and looking past each other. Uh, that, let's hope that that's just a, a, a bad phase. Um, when the UK left the uh, EU, the government decided that it needed, uh, uh, in the end, a free trade agreement and a continued arrangement uh, for police and judicial cooperation with the EU collectively. But it didn't need, or at least it didn't want, any institutional relationship with the EU concerning defence and foreign policy. Um, sadly, that appears to remain the case a year later. However, in many common interests we have that require or will require common approaches. On the contrary, British ministers have seemed to have spent the last year looking for friends everywhere in the world other than on their own doorstep and act and trying to act as if the EU either didn't exist or didn't matter anymore now that we'd left it. And I, I speak as uh, a dual national. I have both French and uh, UK citizenship. So this uh, eats me up personally. The government promulgated a national security strategy, as we've heard, that had an EU-sized hole in the middle of it. It reaffirmed the commitment to European security, backed, as we've heard, by a significant increase in defence spending. But it framed that commitment almost entirely in terms of NATO and bilateral or plurilateral arrangements with a handful of continental countries. Um, now, the EU is about to leave a similar UK-sized hole, I fear, in its strategic compass, which is due to be adopted at a summit in March and is being discussed by ministers in Brest today. I'm told that the current wording has only one reference to the EU at all, which says, we remain ready, as we have been before, to enhance our security and defence relationship with the UK. Well, big deal. Of course, in real life, we're far more interdependent than that. Britain's ambition to punch above its weight in the world, which was the unspoken assumption behind the 2021 integrated review, is increasingly, I think, out of kilter with the reality that having left the EU has reduced it. And here I quote the words of a 16th century Italian political philosopher, Giovanni Botero, to the status of un mezzano. And un mezzano is a, a middle-sized country without a lot of influence on global affairs. Now, it's equally true that Britain's departure 
has reduced the EU's collective weight in world affairs. So we've both lost out. In terms of international security policy, London's priorities since Brexit, and I'm using the Brexit word which British diplomats are no longer allowed to utter, um, have been strengthened, uh, have been to strengthen its relationship with the United States, despite their differences over Brexit, um, to press for a wider political and global role for NATO, which as we heard from uh, General Vigilant, the French try to limit to being pure, a purely military alliance, um, and to try to build up the Five Eyes intelligence community of English-speaking country as a sort of more general strategic alliance focused in particular on the Indo-Pacific, with limited results, I have to say. The notion of any regular or structured relationship or dialogue with the, with the EU on these matters was and remains politically taboo for the Conservative Party. Even very modest su suggestions made by civil servants that perhaps it would be wise for the UK to pursue at least the kind of arm's length engagement with the EU on defense procurement and civilian military cooperation that the United States and Norway are building were swatted firmly by ministers. We are nowhere for now. And in some ways I have to say, we've gone below nowhere. By gleefully jumping into the AUKUS deal about which we heard a little earlier, by behaving conf confrontationally over cross-channel migration, which we've just heard about, and fishing rights for French trawlers, and by trying to renege on trade great, uh, arrangements that it freely agreed to for Northern Ireland, the UK has severely undermined trust in Paris, in Brussels, and to extend a substantial extent in Berlin too. So where do we go from here? Well, first, I think we should uh, be even-handed and take stock of what cooperation between London and continental cap capitals hasn't been broken and continues to work. Let's look at a couple of case studies from recent uh, or current security crises. The UK continues to play a role in the EU-led P5 plus one negotiations with Iran on reviving the nuclear accord. Within that setting, the, the Foreign Office's political director as the lead EU, uh, UK negotiator confers regularly with his external action service, French and German counterparts, and they've prepared and taken a common line in the stalled talks. Um, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss announced on Twitter, would you believe, on the 28th, that she'd spoken by telephone with the EU High Representative, Josep Borrell, about the Ukraine crisis. I mention this because her predecessor never admitted to uh, even having talked to the EU. Um, Truss has also uh, had an unannounced meeting with Borrell on the sidelines of the G7 ministerial meeting in Liverpool. Could this be the start of a more regular dialogue, at least on crisis management? Well, it's too early to tell, but it would be a good idea. Um, for now, London and Brussels have no forum to discuss issues such as sanctions, which are key to trying to influence Russian behavior, nor to coordinate their separate efforts to provide support and security training for Ukraine. Indeed, the UK has been keen to assert its new nimbleness. Oh, look how clever we are now that we're out of the EU. Um, by getting out ahead of the EU, on one or two sanctions decisions, notably on Myanmar, and in sending a, a few army engineers to Poland to help in the, uh, on the border with Belarus, while the EU was conducting the effective negotiations that have more or less cut off the migrant flights from the Middle East to Kiev. I'm told the UK and the EU also continue to coordinate on the Western Balkans in the Quint on how to handle the latest problems in Bosnia and between Kosovo and Serbia. So. These are straws in the wind, but they don't add up to a policy. I'm also told that um, uh, to efforts to institute regular uh, E3 meetings of the UK, France and Germany at the level of defense and foreign ministers and of senior civil servants uh, stalled after the first video conferences last year, possibly because of French anger uh, over the AUKUS deal we mentioned. Now, numerous think tankers, including myself, in a report I uh, published in 2018, in which I had some very useful brainstorming with uh, Alice, 
um, have, have argued that the UK and the EU would both benefit from some institutional arrangements for regular consultation on foreign security and development policy, as well as on military operations and on the defense industry cooperation. In Safer Together, my report, I suggested constructing a relationship a bit akin to the Enhanced Opportunities Partnership that NATO has with non-members such as Sweden and Finland. I thought the idea of uh, uh, using NATO as a bit of a model might appeal to the Brits. So far, I have to say, such proposals have fallen on deaf ears in London, although some civil servants certainly favor such an approach. And they've also encountered reluctance in Paris. I think some people in the French establishment would undoubtedly prefer future cooperation with the UK on security and defense matters to run through Paris bilaterally or through the European Intervention in Initiative, which uh, uh, General Vigilant mentioned, rather than directly with the EU 27 or the External Action Service or the Commission. Yet, bilateral defense co cooperation between the UK and France, despite what we've heard, has also been a bit stalled since uh, uh, well before the AUKUS row. Uh, to be sure, the Lancaster House treaties, which are the backbone the bedrock of that uh, cooperation remains in force and collaboration on nuclear weapons, for example, remains crucial for both countries. There's a real interdependency there. But ambitions to develop a future air combat system, as we heard from Sylvie Berman uh, together, have been superseded for the moment by rival Franco-German Spanish and UK Italian Swedish projects. In my judgment, and I, I'd be interested to hear General Vigilant's view on this, there's zero chance of two separate European sixth generation uh, fighter systems seeing daylight in a market that's already dominated by the US F-35. Neither consortium will be able to afford the cost. So logically, there'll either be one European system or there'll be none. Either the rival European projects will merge or the UK-led effort will be subsumed into a US program. I have to say the way UK politics stand today, the latter seems far more likely, though not more desirable in my view. Um, that leads to a wider question, which is to what extent will the UK remain part of the European defense industrial base? And how far will it inevitably drift further into the US military industrial complex? The future of several cross-channel defense companies hinges on that choice. I think of MBDA, the missile maker, Thales of France, uh, Leonardo of Italy, and to an extent Airbus. They all have big op operations uh, in and with the UK. Well, the answer depends partly on whether the UK and the EU can start to rebuild at least some institutional cooperation. So here are some practical suggestions. Um, on the defense industry side, the minimum starting point seems to me would be for the UK to negotiate an administrative agreement with the European Defense Agency, as the United States is doing, and seek a way to work with the European Defense Fund as a third country. It should also, in my view, join the PESCO project on military mobility, which is really important for NATO's reinforcement strategy, as the United States has done. And it should consider case-by-case, pay-to-play collaboration with other PESCO projects that are developing capabilities that may be useful to the UK. In my view, the UK should also negotiate an arrangement of some sort for cooperation with CSDP missions, as the US and Norway have done. This in no way creates an, oblig an obligation to do anything or spend any money. It doesn't relinquish control to use that favorite phrase. Um, now, <laughs> going beyond that, we need to work together already. We're in the Mediterranean and in the Horn of Africa, and where the EU already has naval missions. And of course, um, naval missions also in the Gulf of Guinea and the Persian Gulf, and in, in due course in the Indo-Pacific, where groups of European countries either are now or will become engaged. It makes no strategic sense for Britain to have less of a security and defense relationship with the EU than the United States, Norway, 
Canada or the United Nations have. Given the state of UK politics and of cross-channel relations that have been described, I don't believe we're going to get very far this year, although it would be a turning point, if at least if we were able to fix the uh, Northern Ireland and fishing disputes. So that, those strike me as being low-hanging fruit, if you like. Um, but the longer we leave it, I think the harder it'll be to start again. There'll be more ground to make up, and we'll have lost a sort of muscle memory on both sides. When Boris John, whether John, Boris Johnson survives in office or not, the dynamics of Conservative Party politics, I'm afraid, still mean that mo the most hardline anti-EU faction will continue to hold the whip hand over the Prime Minister. So my reluctant conclusion is that building a sensible, practical security and defence relationship between the UK and the EU is unlikely to start before the next general election, which, as you know, is due in 2025, unless the Fixed Term Parliament Act is repealed or circumvented. Um, it will probably have to await a change of governing party as well. In the meantime, the best we can hope for, sadly, is events driven muddling through with minimal cooperation, or if you want to put a more optimistic gloss on it, uh, a phase of learning by doing and ad-libbing without a script. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, um, and also outlining practical solutions uh, in terms of cooperation, joining the European Defence Agency, for instance, or, or the PESCO project, but also highlighting the role of domestic politics um, that plays in, in, in two foreign policy and security. Val Samis, um, you are our last speaker, and I just want to announce also to those who are listening to us uh, that... Uh, I think you will speak until four and I still want to take 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So please, for those uh, who are uh, running to the uh, academic sessions, please note it will start a little bit later, 10 minutes later. So we have uh, full time to, to take the questions uh, in the comments. So you are Professor of European Criminal Law and Global Security. Director of the Criminal Justice Center, but also Dean uh, for, for Global Engagement in, in Europe at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and you have extensively uh, written on, on criminal cooperation uh, in Europe and, and provided evidence uh, to uh, the House of Commons um, and the House of Lords and also EU uh, institutions. Uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the kind introduction. I promise that I will uh, finish in 10 minutes. I'm, I will aim to do three things in these 10 minutes. Uh, talking about internal security, which is an area where perhaps there has been and there is closer cooperation uh, between the EU and the UK in comparison to both immigration and defense. And I want to do three things, as I said. So the first one is to give you some background and context regarding the EU-UK relationship on internal security before Brexit. The second thing is to uh, give you a, a brief overview of the provisions of, of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, in the field, and uh, finally, uh, to uh, really discuss what is the way forward and what is the future for EU-UK uh, cooperation in the fields of law enforcement, internal security, and criminal justice. So first of all, what was happening before Brexit? And there, you know, we had really a paradox, which was reflected also uh, in Ambassador Berman, who talked about uh, the UK being uh, not being a croyant, but being a praticant. And it is true very much so in the field of internal security, where we had really a contradiction. On the one hand, politically, uh, the UK uh, was against uh, European integration in criminal matters, against supranational, if you like, EU law in the field of criminal justice, stemming from the belief uh, that criminal justice and the exercise of power uh, is uh, uh, really uh, at the domain of state sovereignty. And this uh, argument was linked to what Violetta was already mention mentioning, uh, that uh, with the fact that uh, uh, the UK also wanted to maintain its border control. So, you know, so we had really at the level of high politics, the United Kingdom 
arguing for, uh, you know, against supranational EU criminal law uh, and in favor of European integration based on cooperation and on intergovernmentalism. At the same time, and uh, after the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, where uh, criminal law has moved to a more supranational decision-making mode, uh, the UK secured, as uh, it had in the field of immigration, a series of uh, so-called opt-outs from, uh, from criminal law and internal security measures. At the same time, though, the UK uh, on the ground has been one of the key shapers of European integration in the field of internal security, in particular as regards judicial cooperation in criminal matters, uh, the, the development of EU agencies, and most importantly, the exchange of personal data for security purposes. And I will give you some examples that, you know, I think give quite a lot of context to what we're talking about. It was the UK in 1998 in the European Council Summit in Cardiff when Jack Straw was the, the Home Secretary who uh, argued in favor of applying the principle of mutual recognition from the internal market to the field of criminal justice. And the emblematic uh, EU instrument on criminal law, the European Arrest Warrant Framework Decision, is a key example of mutual recognition. At the same time, the UK uh, has been really very influential in the development uh, of uh, the EU criminal justice agencies, Europol and Eurojust. Some argue that the UK has contributed towards uh, exporting its own internal model of intelligence-led policing into Europol. Uh, Rob Wainwright was the Europol director before Brexit and he was highly influential into the future of Europol. And two of the presidents of Eurojust, uh, including the inaugural president, Mike Kennedy, came from the UK. At the same time, as was already mentioned, the UK was very keen on the uh, development of a data-driven model of, uh, of EU uh, security, uh, including, for example, an emphasis on personal data, PNR data, DNA data, and so on and so forth. So, you know, so while on the one hand, politically before Brexit, we had the UK stating that, you know, this is really uh, an area which is close to state sovereignty. In practice, <laughs> the UK has pushed really for further European integration in the field of security, perhaps at the expense uh, of civil liberties uh, and human rights, but still very, very influential and a very big consumer of European integration, for example, in the field of Europol data. So what we have uh, is uh, with the challenge in the trade and cooperation agreement was really, first of all, we had political will by both parties to have something on internal security in the treaty. I find it interesting, you know, there's nothing on migration, nothing on defense, but you know, on criminal law, both parties, we talked about a trade and security agreement. Um, and the, the challenge there was how much to replicate the UK status as an EU member state in an era where the UK would be a third country. Because we know that by being a third country comes with its own constitutional limitations. So what we have in the TCA, I would categorize as three levels of ambition in the field of internal security, taking the UK's constitutional status uh, into account. The first level is the areas of high ambition, where I think the two parties have tried to replicate to the extent possible the pre-Brexit uh, legal uh, framework. And the main examples there are extradition. So the treaty talks about the arrest warrant, which replicates largely the European arrest warrant system. Uh, it is also uh, the area of confiscation of the proceeds of crime and the areas of data exchanges in the form of PNR data and DNA databases. Um, the second, the mid, the mid level of ambition, if you like, are areas such as mutual legal assistance, where the treaty largely refer, reverts back to Council of Europe uh, cooperation mechanism, and also the UK participation uh, relationship, if you like, with the Europol and Eurojust, where although there is political will, there are constitutional limits by the fact that the UK is now a third country. The third area is the area of low ambition, where we, uh, we that emanates from uh, really the, the fact that the UK is the third country. So the UK is not allowed, no longer allowed to have access to EU databases. Violetta mentioned Eurodac, there is also the Schengen Information System, the Europol database, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the UK cannot, can no longer have direct access, and the challenge there is how best to, uh, to compensate, if you like, uh, for, for that. So, you know, so we have quite a lot going on in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The fact also that the UK does not participate in the, in the databases 
challenges the operation of, for example, extradition agreements, because as some of you may know, the European arrest warrant is largely linked to uh, alerts that are introduced within the Schengen information system. So now that the UK can no longer do that, then you know uh, it has to go via Interpol or other international fora. So that makes things more cumbersome in a sense. So in the two minutes that I have left, I'll just uh, um, say share with you a few thoughts about what, what happens now. And the key challenge, I think, now for the future is twofold. It's, there's an operational challenge and there's a constitutional challenge. In terms of operational cooperation, even in the areas where we have high ambition, for example, the arrest warrants, the UK authorities face the challenge of convincing, persuading the European counterparts to continue to prioritize UK requests in the same way as they do with requests from their counterparts in EU member states. And with measures that, uh, that operate uh, under very strict deadlines, this may be a challenge in practice. So, you know, there is really a charm offensive, I think, that has to happen from the perspective of the UK uh, in order to continue the seamless and quick uh, cooperation. But there is also the most important uh, issue currently is the constitutional issue and the issue of regulatory alignment and the issue of benchmarks. Because as we know, cooperation in the TCA is contingent upon uh, the UK respecting human rights, including enforcing human rights at the domestic level, and the UK uh, really being considered a third country which provides an adequate level of data protection. And data uh, protection is a huge uh, issue, I think, in the future. The European Commission has already uh, uh, concluded in June that currently the UK provides an adequate level of data protection, but this assessment will be uh, made regularly. It's not set in stone. And it is interesting to see, uh, as we have heard, how far the UK will go to, to diverge, if you like, from the uh, standards of the GDPR, uh, which it has in incorporated in domestic law, in order uh, to create a more flexible data uh, environment within the UK, and whether this will have an actual impact on cooperation in the future. So issues such as regulatory alignment, uh, observance of benchmarks, what will happen with the Human Rights Act in the future will have a direct impact on EU-UK cooperation in the field. I will stop here, but I very much look forward to our discussions. Thank you very much. And, and please do not hesitate also amongst the participants to, to react on, on each other uh, presentation or, or to have questions. I have uh, from the comments uh, appearing on my screen, I have two uh, points that have been made or two areas that we have not tackled that much. The first one is um, the, the lessons that we should draw from the situation in Afghanistan. So we have a question on on role of EU, UK, NATO, US, um, and, and whether uh, this could have an impact also on the future of EU-UK relations. Uh, and um, similarly, uh, I think the role of the US was mentioned by the ambassador a little bit before and, and the speech by Joe Biden. But if any of you had any um, thoughts about, uh, and, and I'm turning maybe, I don't know, maybe Paul, you could cover that as well, the, the, the impact of uh, the US on the future of European security and defense. Uh, that's a question from Irene Marinova from Colorado State University, uh, because we know also that the US has been involved quite heavily in developing uh, European defense. And we can go back to the 50s and, and the war in Korea, when actually um, it also helped to develop the Western European um Union. Um, and I see a last question uh, from the, someone in the Union from the NATO Defense College. Um, and um, I think uh, this, this could be addressed maybe to Jean-Marc Vigilant, but please feel free uh, to say if you feel comfortable with this question. How would you evaluate the potential for cooperation between the UK and other European partners in the Black Sea security theater? Uh, so I think we have uh, several issues and um, yeah, maybe I see Paul, would you like to take the, the floor first? Yeah, I'm happy. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, and thanks to all of the speakers. Uh, it's really, I think our, uh, our, our com comments really dovetailed. Um, I think that we have the most permissive environment and uh, the most permissive and, uh, US administration we're ever likely to get. Uh, for developing uh, a European defense capabilities and 
uh, a degree of strategic autonomy. I'm always a bit careful with that term. It means different things to different people, and it's a bit of a red flag for some. Uh, I understand the, the strategic autonomy in the way that General Vigilant described it, that it's the capacity for the EU to act, which means capabilities. It also means to a limited extent structures uh, where the United States and NATO are not involved. Um, and that high end, um, uh, uh, high intensity conflict, especially uh, the defense of Europe as a continent uh, versus Russia, uh, remains clearly and consensually the affair of NATO. Uh, but better European defense capabilities would, would help very strongly with that as well. Um, now, going from that, I mean, the, you know, the, the, this is the first US administration that is sitting down with the EU for discussions on defense. That's never happened before. Um, and so that's that's quite a big thing. And it ought to be uh, create a permissive environment for the EU to advance. However, I have to say that on the one hand, there is the UK, which because it's no longer in the EU, has almost a vested interest in um, um, rear, rear guard resistance and saying, no, no, it's NATO, NATO, NATO is the only thing, the only show in town. Um, uh, but also that there are uh, Central and East European countries which are deeply suspicious of the agenda of European defense and worry that it in some way will weaken the US commitment and the NATO uh, backing uh, with, uh, with the United States that they need facing Russia. And so they have to be reassured all the time, but they never are really reassured. Um, so I think that that will help the, uh, the Europeans. But um, again, we've got an awful lot in terms of developing uh, the European defense initiatives, which began in 2017. We've done a lot in terms of process and in creating programs. We don't yet have an awful lot more capability to show for it. And until the Europeans actually, and they are increasing spending, uh, are actually producing, developing new capabilities that they can use together, um, then you know, the UK will rightly feel that it's not missing very much by not being involved in that. Um, very briefly on Afghanistan, I think that somehow hurt the UK even more than it hurt um, uh, others, uh, uh, European participants, because um, the absence of, co uh, of, of uh, uh, coordination and prior uh, consultation uh, and the, 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 you know, very rushed way in which it was done left the UK and its interests on the ground more exposed. And the UK government ended up with a ridiculous choice of whether to evacuate pets or interpreters, and it chose pets. So, you know, we've, we, it, was a, it was a political embarrassment for the UK, more so than for France, which tended to sort of see this as confirming its own view. Well, you know, the United States is increasingly disengaging from uh, um, not Europe and the greater Middle East or all the way to Central Asia in order to focus on China. And therefore, we Europe have to fill our own vacuum, uh, a view that is not shared, I think, in, in Warsaw or in, in Vilnius. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just before giving the floor to Jean-Marc Vigilant, um, just, I also saw a question for Alice as well uh, in the chat regarding what you wrote in your book and especially on the role of Germany, if, if you'd like to, to evaluate the position of Germany in the context of um, the, uh, their ability also to limit the cooperation of UK and France. Uh, General, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, with regard to the uh, Af Afghan withdrawal, or at least uh, the, the Western forces uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, I would say that, uh, as you know, um, after the first mission was completed, meaning uh, preventing Al-Qaeda from um, being able to strike uh, Western countries again, and that was made within three or four months after the start of the intervention, there was a mission creep to uh, state building. Uh, and then uh, when 20 years after uh, the US came to the, to the conclusion that it was impossible to, uh, to build a democracy in, uh, in Afghanistan, they chose to, to withdraw. The problem there was uh, the, the lack of strategic dialogue. And I think that that was for the sake of, secret, of security. They wanted so much to keep 
secret the withdraw the, the, the exact day that they just sorry they just forgot to 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 talk to their allies however um, um if you remember the operation hamilton in 2018 uh, the us the uk and france uh, decided to launch a strike on syria uh, in response to the use of chemical uh, weapons by uh, bashar el-assad then uh, we had a perfect uh, strategic dialogue and strategic planning and and we will be able to do so in the future uh, for uh, any crisis any rising crisis um, then i'm confident that we have several forums to do so for uh, the first one is nato uh, but we can also have this kind of uh, um, and dialogue and, and planning in a multilateral uh, environment or in a coalition environment um, one 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 point on on the us and eu uh, relations um, i think that we had a misunderstanding at the very beginning of the creation of nato with regard to burden sharing for the eu countries they thought that um, the us would take over the full protection of the continent if uh, the eu countries uh, would um, uh, leave some kind of sovereignty and, and capacity uh, to decide uh, uh, on uh, defense and security issues um, in fact the us want the eu to share to share the responsibility of protecting the continent uh, and, and they want us to share the burden at the strategic level but at the same time uh, despite the article 3 of the uh, atlantic alliance treaty they are kind of economic competitors as we've seen so far uh, this is the situation in which we are today um, i would like uh, in that regard to to answer to uh, one of the alice's points uh, about the CSDP not being the right tool to address the, the hybrid threats or the new, the new challenges. I think um, that the EU, not only the CSDP, the EU is a perfect organization because within the EU, you have the different, what I call factors of power. You have the different tools. CSDP is just one of them for military action, but obviously you will be able to use economic tools. You were referring to trade, etc. So that's why it's, EU is, is the most comprehensive organization to, to, um, to deal with um, hybrid threat uh, and, and, and promote a kind of global approach. Um, we were talking about uh, the, yes, a question from the NDC with regard to uh, the UK cooperation with uh, other uh, European countries in the Black Sea. Um, as I've said, when we want uh, European countries uh, to discuss uh, defense and security issues with non-EU country like the US, like the UK, Norway, uh, uh, or Canada, NATO is a perfect is a perfect uh, framework. Uh, however, this does not prevent all these countries to come up and discuss together in a multilateral or ad hoc uh, setting. Um, therefore, if uh, the UK has common interest with other uh, European countries uh, to discuss and try to, to find a way to deal with the security, uh, the security issues in the Black Sea, they will do so. And, and I don't see any, any problem in, in, uh, in arriving to this situation. And uh, last, uh, I, I have uh, taken the point of, of Paul with regard to the two uh, six gen fighters. Um, I thought that when we had this issue uh, with the Rafale and the Eurofighters in the in the 90s. Uh, we had learned from that time and unfortunately it doesn't seem to be the case. So I hope that we will be able to, to have a political convergence uh, so that we, we come up with a, a single uh, European um, weapon system or fighter aircraft uh, for the sixth gen generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will give uh, the last uh, remark and response maybe to Alice. Would you like to take the question on Germany as a conclusion? And then I'm really sorry for the other speakers, but time is running very fast. So I, I encourage you to continue the conversation. Also on Twitter, we have a few nice quotes from the debate. So please do not hesitate. Alice. 
Thank you so much, Ayla. I'll be I'll be very quick indeed. Uh, we're uh, short on time, but um, thank you so much for referring to my book. It's always uh, weird and um, uh, when people actually <laughs> seem to have read it. So thank you for that. Um, um, so, so indeed, what I what I write in the book is that there is competition between bilateral corporations. So the Franco-German uh, link will sometimes compete with the uh, Franco-UK one, and then the UK-US relationship will also um, sort of limit what France and the UK can do. So that's the general idea, and that has been ex exacerbated by by Brexit due to the um, indeed the the opposite positions that that France and the UK uh, have had on the debate or negotiations. And so the, the consequence has been indeed something that Paul referred to, uh, a potential even increase in the depth of UK-US links, which translates uh, in uh, the uh, industrial base that of the UK that is increasingly Americanized and then increased cooperation on um, via AUKUS now and on may potentially on China and on technological issues. So that UK-US link is, is reinforced. Meanwhile, the Franco-German link is also reinforced because it is already at the at the basis, at the heart of the European project and considering uh, the, um, the efforts to, to maintain technology keep European integration going despite Brexit, it remains so fundamental to, to France. And I think when it comes to the new German government and, and the coalition, if you look at the coalition agreement, it says, uh, you know, the coalition wants to to have a close uh, security and defense cooperation with, with the UK. The, the German coalition says so, but they also want uh, international agreements to be respected. And so I feel that when it comes to the UK, um, the, the German position will be that so long as, uh, you know, there are conflict about the Brexit agreement, um, there, there won't be uh, particularly... Uh, keen to to develop stronger links with, with the UK and so we will stay in the same position as we as we are now in terms of the bilaterals however one thing I say in the book as well is that some sometimes one way of um, making a bilateral work is by is through trilateralization uh, and I think the general mentioned the um, Hamilton mission that brought UK, US and French forces together uh, in Syria uh, in fighting against uh, chemical weapon facilities there. Uh, and when it comes to FCAS, uh, you know, a trilateral, an, an internationalization of the of the the project, bringing together those that are currently competing, would be a form of success. And I think we, we hear more and more now this this option uh, being discussed, at least in in those um, circles of people who are not in charge. But maybe that means that you know the mood is changing as well when it comes to to this project, and um, and the success would be um, further France. France, Germany, UK links and France, UK, US link and quad. So I think that's that's the way to 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 look at it. Uh, and I think uh, bilaterals are the heart of those networks, but uh, are not sufficient many times. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, I will have to close now. And Paul, do you have a very short remark? Because we, we need to go all into the academic panel. So one, 30 seconds. Really, 30 seconds. Just to say on Black Sea, um, it's a classic example where we could be doing more together. But the UK has got a separate program, which is useful in uh, uh, training and developing the Ukrainian Navy. Um, the EU has a, has a mission. Uh, in uh, Kiev, which does uh, security uh, capacity building. And it's going to be expanded, I hear from the, from the breast meeting, uh, to more uh, intelligence, uh, uh, cyber, and possibly even military uh, areas. That's a classic example where we need to work together uh, and not, uh, you know, each one plowing their own furrow. But will we? Hope so. On this, on this note, uh, I would like to thank you very warmly for your time, for, for your thoughtful uh, and insightful remarks. I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground and um, we are now going to discuss um, uh, further uh, this issue in two panels. Panel 101, reshaping the EU-UK trade and economic relationship and policies. And then the second panel tonight is on the impact of Brexit on EU foreign and defense strategies with, with presentation of, of uh, new data and research by our uh, academic colleagues. Thank you to all. I wish you uh, a good end of afternoon and uh, keep following uh, our hashtag and Twitter account. Thank you. <laughs>